Right now, our dispatch is down over 30%. I think Sierra's at, at less than 50%. Um, MODOC's about the same way. So we're all looking for ways to combine resources to still get the job done and provide the service to the public and um, you know, try to help each other. And none of us are really that busy. Lassen's probably the busiest, but the other two counties are um, not very busy at all. So you know, trying to take that load on. So we're really trying to explore that um piece of it and um you know other than i know greg glavich is trying to do some stuff between mendocino and humboldt county some interconnectivity stuff that have been talking about for years um that that's about all i know that's going on up here in the north okay thank you for that update mike um moving on to cap a um i since andy and cody aren't out i believe lj nielsen who's on the call is going to brief out for them yes um and Shelley, I wanted to let you know that uh, Steve Yarborough is on his way over. OK, thank you. You bet. So for the Capitol Bay, um, Andy um, Smith is out on um, medical leave right at the moment. Uh, Cody is in Europe <laughs> and he refused to join, even though I asked him to. <laughs> um, but we've got a couple of things going on. Representatives from the San Francisco and Santa Clara area met, uh, actually they met yesterday and today in Dallas to coordinate the World Cup communication radio frequency plans, um, the standard operating procedures and situational awareness processes. In addition to the in-person meeting with the other 11 U.S. cities, there is a standing emergency comms World Cup coordination meeting bi-monthly. Uh, the next thing is that uh, to support Bay Area large events, we have a planned COML train the trainer class course um, that will be happening October 28th to the 31st. And um, uh, according to Artina, that'll create a, a cadre to begin training COMELs across the area. And that's all I've got. Thank you for that update, LJ. And yeah. um, just to piggyback on that COMEL train the trainer course that's coming up in October, if anybody in your planning areas are interested in that class, please reach out to LJ. Um, we're, I think we're looking for at least 15 participants, um, but we're also looking into roping in um, our other uh, states such as Nevada and Arizona to participate as well. But we're definitely opening up to California first. Right. Thanks, okay. Shelley. You're welcome. All right. Uh, seeing if anybody joined from Central. Hearing none, uh, moving on to Southern Planning Area updates. Um, still, uh, well, the Southern Planning Area had been uh, dark, I think, for a little bit, um, just because of some uh, changes and shuffles in um, who's representing each agency, who's uh, who's on the planning area. Um, so we're just kind of getting built back up. We are um, still reaching out to the people who had been participating before. We're trying to build up new uh, email contact lists as well. <clears throat> um, we're also uh, going to be rewriting the charter for the uh, spa. Uh, unless somebody else happens to have a copy of the prior one recreating that and um i'll say the last meeting we had was uh same sort of uh focus that um capillary had um just getting ready to keep those lines of communication open for um deconfliction and planning for uh, world cup uh, olympics coming up after that and um yeah that's about it all right, Dale, thank you for that update. Also, Monique Shells, who's um, in my unit, is assigned um, to Southern Planning Area. So um, if you want some information, I believe we have the SPA, um, at least the CalSeq Charter for SPA um, in our records. So if you want to take a look at that, uh, that might give you some information you might uh, be looking for. Yep, that'd be very helpful. Thanks. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Um, okay, moving on to approved TA requests. Um, so just wanted to give an update. We've been working on updating our Cal IFOG and good news. It's finally been approved um, and we are just currently going under the, um, the accessible, uh, making the document accessible to load onto our website. But if you would like a copy personally emailed to you, um, reach out and we can email that over to you um, as well as uh, 
once we'll let you know once it's been formally posted to our website. Um, along with that, because we have the IFOG approved, we also have a digital uh, uh, version online, both in the um, Apple and um, Google store. So it's available for download now. And um, hopefully in about two years, we'll, we'll begin this process again. And if you notice any discrepancies in the document, um, please note that to that to us and we'll up make sure that that is updated in the, in the next iteration. All right, uh, moving on to another TA request is the uh, train the trainer course. Um, that's the one that uh, LJ mentioned that'll be um, held October 28th. The location will be de determined, but in the Bay Area. Again, if you are interested in taking that course, please reach out to, reach out to LJ and she'll add you to the list. Um, and upcoming exercises we have again is the COML training. Um, th there is a uh, tabletop exercise um, in the works for World Cup planning to be held in the city of Los Angeles. Um, Monique is working with, um, I believe, Tom Lawless in our Southern Spa area uh, with the planning of that. So that will be coming up. And another training we have is actually next week, and it's going to be the Joint All Hazard Awareness and Assessment Exercise. It's a uh, four-day exercise where we will be partnering with um, various agencies to go over um, communications and, and coordination during um, multiple different scenarios. So um, if you're interested in attending, please reach out. Um, I can get the information to you. I believe there, there is openings still available, and that's going to be held at McClellan Park next week. All right, um, we're moving on to 911 branch updates. I have a microphone. I move. Or shall I? Wait, I think we got it. We'll just use Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. <clears throat> All right, hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Matson. I am program chief here at the 911 office uh, at OAS. Today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Next Gen 911 and the deployment that's ongoing in the state of California. Um, <clears throat> recent efforts have been concentrated on um, sort of uh, reworking our deployment strategy. We were uh, working towards testing in all regions at multiple PSAPs a day, and then uh, you know uh, working from that point forward to uh, assess. Uh, readiness and uh, attempt to go live at these sites. Uh, what we discovered was we had far too many, um, <clears throat> far too many sites to go through that we that, that outpaced our resources. So we really weren't accomplishing the goal that we set out to accomplish. We were just testing for the sake of testing and uh, running into issues and not being able to um, allocate resources to fix them. So what we did is we went back, we refocused our approach. <clears throat> And we worked with a vendor that we've hired on, uh, Promethean One, in conjunction with 911 Authority, to uh, to help us reconfigure our our go live strategy. So what we've done is we've gone ahead and we've uh, focused our efforts uh, primarily in Kern County for right now. Uh, we're doing uh, testing and retesting and retesting again to get PSAPs ready uh, for go live in that area. Uh, we're coming very, very close now. We have conditional passes on testing at four of the nine PSAPs that we are uh, currently identifying for go live. So right now uh, that effort is showing uh, early results and we should have some PSAPs uh, going live uh, within the next two weeks in Kern County. Um, <clears throat> concurrently, we're also working with Cal State LA uh, who uh, they are dealing at uh, the PSAP there. They're dealing with um, off campus um, cop copper theft over and over and over again, and they are um, repeatedly losing uh, 911 service. Uh, they're getting their trunks basically uh, stolen out from under them. So uh, we did some analyzing uh, their situation there, and we're going to go ahead and um, migrate uh, bandwidth, which is a VoIP carrier there, uh, carries 87% of their traffic, and hopefully um, will be a success story for us to get that traffic migrated there and um, you know uh, uh, mitigate the impacts of this of this copper theft that is obviously ongoing so uh, that migration is set to take place tomorrow we're very excited about that so moving forward uh, we'll have two teams that we're going to kind of break uh, oes and the vendors up into uh, one will be a, a pre-migration or readiness team uh, who will essentially go out um, <clears throat> and uh, virtually go out we're not going out into the field but we'll be working with PSAPs. Uh, to assess readiness, to uh, do all the testing that needs to be done up until go live. Uh, and then we'll have a second team, which will be our migration team, who will come in after that first team has done their work and they'll um, uh, work on migrating carriers. 
So very excited about this. Uh, that that process is taking shape right now. Uh, really, we're just trying to get some early successes and see how the go lives go in Kern County. Uh, once uh, we we've, we've really um, seen how those shape up and we get some performance at some larger PSAPs, uh, we want to see how the network really um, performs under under uh, you know under duress, right? With with large call volumes, uh, then we'll move forward uh, at scale. So, <clears throat> so very excited about that. Uh, with cloud process, cloud uh, CPE or cloud 911 call processing, uh, the lab certification process continues. We have seven vendors that have completed uh, OES certification and are now uh, able to sell in California. We have two more uh, going through the process, AT&T with Motorola and then Motorola Direct. So they are uh, hoping to wrap up in the next few weeks. Um, we uh, are continuing to work with our vendors on connectivity issues. This is a back-end connectivity, cloud decor. Um, that uh, issue is, is being worked, and we hope to have all of our connectivity in place and set up and tested and validated and running at the end of this month. And uh, at that point, we'll have uh, the ability to lift all our stock clocks for call handling and really um, start to blanket the state with uh, with new cloud-based call handling. And uh, that's really, uh, that's it for me, Shelley. Any questions? So Andrew, it's Mike Grant. I got a quick question for you. <clears throat> yeah, Mike. Um, and it's not gonna be about the ongoing thing we have going here specifically to us, but <clears throat> I'm getting pounded by vendors wanting to sell us next-gen equipment. And my first question I ask them, I, if you're on the state contract, and I get a wide variety of responses to that from we are, we're in the testing process, you know, we're, we're almost there. Um, you don't need to be on the state contract. You could buy whatever you want. Um, I, I think, uh, and I haven't seen anything if it was sent out, but I think something from you of a list uh, or your office of a list of approved vendors um, would be really helpful so that we know that we're talking to someone that we could actually um, reasonably do business with and not waste time with people that are trying to sell a pipe dream, if you will. Uh, that is great feedback, Mike. Uh, I appreciate that. Any vendor that comes in that is not certified, wherever, whatever uh, dance they're they're trying to do, um, they're they're not supposed to be selling. We do have a list. Uh, it is available on our website. It is updated as vendors pass through labs. So if you go to uh, caloes.ca.gov slash 911. If you scroll down uh, past the buttons, there's a couple buttons that send you to contracts or forms or whatever. If you scroll down, it's a second link on our website. It says approved vendors, uh, contact information. So there's a list with up to the minute uh, information with every vendor that's been approved and all the contact information for their sales reps. So hopefully that can help you out. Mike, Mike yeah, this so is LJ. I will send you the link. Oh, okay, I, I can find it, LJ. I seen that one. It's it's you know like right now we use AT and T, and they go well we're in the process and you know so is it in the process? I, you know I, and maybe this can't be answered. Are they um, like you said right now? Either maybe just a couple of weeks away. But the folks that I've talked to, um, they don't know if they're two weeks away or a year away. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and then then they want to talk to us and we've had very good luck with their technicians in the field. And now I know I'm getting specific to my agency. I don't want to do that in this meeting, but um, I, I just, I don't want to waste a lot of time. I, we got all wearing so many hats now because we're down so far on personnel. Uh, but at the same time, we, we need to be planning for that transition, right? So um, yeah. I'll look at the website and I'll work on that. And then if, if, if you got it, the next couple that are, on your horizon or within the next couple of weeks, then they're gonna pop up on the website and it's all a moot point, so. Absolutely, Mike, and 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 as always, please, if you have any questions or if you're unsure or if vendors are spinning you around, reach out to our office. Uh, Janae Dabrowski is the uh, supervisor over the advisory and compliance unit, so call handling is her, her um, area of responsibility, so uh, we'll get you any information you need anytime. Okay. Uh, my, my comment was, and, and LJ, maybe this is something to you, it just would, I know, the other PSAPs that I've been dealing with lately, they're at running into the same thing, whether they, they know it's on the website or they don't. I'm getting calls from vendors trying to sell something. And um, it's interesting. It's sometimes it takes 15 minutes to get an answer out of them if they're actually on the contract or not, that's, or they're that's close. That's the first to red flag. 
<laughs> yeah, well, I know, I know. But, you know, at the same time, uh, some of them have some neat features and, you know, I, I don't know. Sure. It, it would just be easy to say, hey, sorry, I don't have time to talk to you. You're not on the list and you're not close to being on the list. So yeah, you were wasting both of our times, right? So, okay, I'm going to get off the, the soapbox. <laughs> All right, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Andrew, did I hear you right? You think the stop clock is going to be lifted within a month? Yeah, Dale, so um, we have been, you know better than most that we've been doing this dance for a while for this connectivity thing. Um, and the vendors have been um, just really non, non-committal and, and a little bit non-responsive, I can say that here. Uh, so we have uh, issued uh, essentially ultimatums. So they have until the 20th, which is five days from now to get, the, to get their final uh, configurations in and tested. Uh, otherwise they are, um, subject to SLAs to the tune of $5,000 a day. So um, we we finally kind of uh, put the documentation out there that that um, we're, we're sort of done uh, waiting. So yeah, the end of this month, uh, we should have some some real progress really fast. Thanks. Anything else? All right, thank you, Andrew, for your update. All right, moving on to the next topic, we have um, Chris updates. Steve, would you like to join us? There you go. And hopefully we can save devs. How about now? All right, you got me. I can tell. Um, okay, so this is Steve Yarbrough. I'm the radio communications branch manager here at PSC with the Chris update. Um, so. As you know, we're in the fifth year of a five-year rollout for this program, coming right to the end of that five years last couple of months here. And so we've got a total of 56 sites that are installed, 54 of them are in wide area trunking. Um, and we're planning to deploy a few more before we get to the end of that five-year performance period. Um, currently, we're also uh, working on getting some VHF technology built into the the radio system uh, in addition to the 700 megahertz that we've been deploying in most places so that's opening up some territory where we can uh, keep reaching into some of the mountainous regions um, we're developing partnerships with a handful of rural counties um, who want to invest in the systems to make sure that we get some coverage in areas that will be beneficial to them that wouldn't have been on our initial deployment um, roadmap. So as we do that, um, we work with these counties and in and, uh, and partner to develop infrastructure in those areas that make sense for them because it's mutually beneficial. Um, considering the whole concept here is interoperability, we want to make sure that we're getting as many interoperable partners onto the system as we can. So that's one of the ways we can actually expand um, into some places that make sense. So that's going very well. Um, we keep getting calls from other counties to uh, initiate partnerships like that. And so anytime we can do that and it makes sense for both the state and the county, we do that. Um, one of the challenges we're running into as we go and continue to deploy um, is that you know some of the facilities that we're using to house the radio equipment aren't exactly set up um, in terms of power or climate control um, to handle the additional radios and the additional heat load that comes into those buildings. And so um, making sure that we can get facility upgrades done ahead of the of the system deployment schedule is kind of been um, stretching out some of our lead times. But so far, we've been able to manage that fairly well, but it continues to be a problem. And I think it's becoming um, an increasing problem because we've gone to the places where it was easy to uh, expand into. And so the stuff that remains is, are places that perhaps aren't as easy to build into. So that's a challenge that we're continuing to, to try and, and overcome. Uh, next slide, if I could, um, or is that the only slide? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Well, so I'll just touch on a couple more points um, then without a slide. Uh, one of the things is, um, you know, we're working with the California Highway Patrol to get them migrated over onto the CRIS system in places where we have a, a coverage footprint that makes sense for them. 
Um, so we keep uh, that project is going forward. Haven't cut over any communications yet for them, but uh, we're hoping to this year. Um, and as we do that, then, you know, we'll do it sort of area office by area office um, in places where it makes sense. And so uh, I expect there to be a more gravitational pull towards using the Chris platform uh, for interoperable communications once uh, CHP gets up and running on that. Um, and then the other thing that's going on is we're, we're continuing to explore other opportunities and funding scenarios um, so that we can continue to move the system forward. Um, as I said, we had the initial funding for the five-year period, and that's over um, at the end of June. And so as we're looking out uh, into the future, we want to keep building this system and keep making it more and more useful for first responders in the state of California. So we're exploring some opportunities, and we're hoping to be able to have an announcement on that front pretty soon here um, that would allow us to continue to build and develop the system. Uh, so I think that's all of the updates that I had. Thank you for that, Steve. Does anybody have any questions before we move on to the next topic? Hearing none, all right, thank you. All right, all right. moving on to the next, we have our PSC CAPS net, um, update. Moises, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Moises Lopez. I'm the Microwave Division Chief here at PSC and providing an update on where we are with the uh, upgrade to uh, the CapsNet microwave system. Um, so currently we're in uh, phase six of six. We started this project in 2018. And as the slide uh, kind of tells you there, we, we've completed uh, phases one through four. Uh, some sites from phase three did not get installed, so we're carrying those over into phase six. And uh, currently we're uh, installing uh, phases five and six. So uh, bottom line is we're about 73% complete from uh, when we started this project uh, six years ago. And uh, CAPSNET, um, as you all know, is... Uh, the microwave backhaul system for the state of California first responders. And this uh, technology is enabling and supporting the CRIS uh, deployment that uh, Steve was talking about earlier. Uh, we're also supporting the next gen 911 uh, microwave backhaul for the PSAPs across the state, not from a uh, primary or secondary backhaul perspective, but we're coming in as a tertiary uh, backhaul uh, for the PSAPs. And in addition to that, just for uh, general knowledge, uh, CAPSNET is also supporting the California Earthquake Early Warning System. And we're uh, deploying about, uh, across the state, about 20, we're supporting about 25% of the earthquake early warning sensors that are deployed across California. And that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions for me. Hey, here, none. Um, thank you so much for your update on, on CAPSNET, Moises. All right, heading on to the next topic. Um, we have our broadband services update. Um, the main one is we're currently working with CalNet and updating um, FirstNet 9.1 and also 19.2 uh, first responder cellular services contracts. Um, they should be uh, in place before the current ones um, expire, which is the second half of, of this year. So uh, hopefully by the summertime or shortly thereafter. Um, we also wanted to give an update that our, our former SWIC, Devin Clark, has left state service um, and uh, we'll be putting out an announcement for his uh, replacement. Um, so if you know anybody who may be interested in uh, becoming our emergency communications division chief, um, reach out to me or um, I can go ahead and forward you the announcement once it gets posted on our um, website. Um, and then also as LJ and other few uh, have alluded to, we are continuing to work with our FEMA counterparts for World Cup planning. Uh, our Tina Moon specifically, she's actually in Dallas uh, today or this week. Um, at one of the planning meetings. And so um, we'll be working with her on those biometric meetings as well. And um, that's it for broadband. 
And um, we also wanted to have our tactical communications update. Um, so tactical communications is our, our group that works out in the field and they're currently purchasing new ISTATs for the regions for the, and for the governor's cabinet. Um, they are also getting their final three trailers delivered soon. Um, our com communication coordinators and our senior comm coordinator will be participating in that JHACS exercise next week at McClellan. Um, and um, they'll be training the IMAT teams on radios and sal satellite phones in May. Um, and they're also preparing for fire season. So TACCOM um, has cash radios that are available during um, and equipment during fire season to fill communication gaps in the arise in the field. And looking at Amanda, is that anything else you have anything else you'd like to add? All right. Um, any questions on the broadband or TACCOM updates? All right, hearing none. All right, just wanted to let everybody know that our next meeting is going to be held August 20th, and it's going to be a combined meeting with our PISRESPEC um, groups. And again, that's on August 20th. And at this time, does anybody have any public comment they would like to add to this meeting? Okay, hearing none. All right, uh, meeting's adjourned. Thank you so much for your participation. And if you do have any other questions or uh, comments or, or things you'd like to add, just reach out to us. We'll make sure we'll we'll, we'll get it in to, um, for next uh, August's meeting. And thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Thanks for Thanks, hosting. Shelley. Thanks, Shelly. Thanks, Shelly. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Bye.